Good evening, lords and ladies. DJ Craigie here with the Progeny Behind the Fang podcast, and joining me as always, my amazing wife and co-host, Ming Chao and Neapolitan Wu. And we're here celebrating our 100th episode, folks. You heard me right. It's been 100 beautiful episodes, some good, some great. And we want to thank all of y'all for being with us for this five years, four years we've been here. And we want to thank all of our amazing guests that have been with us throughout this process. Our Apirian Oberon and our source. It's just been a great ride. And most of all, thank you to Diabolic Domino for giving us this opportunity to make our fangs shine. So 100 episodes, my darling husband, it's been, like you said, it's been up, it's been down, it's been a roller coaster. We've had renegades, we've had rogues, we've had uh, power couples, you know, it's the good, the bad, the ugly, we've had it all here. Um, When we first started doing this, we got this amazing opportunity. We were very nervous. We were (laughs) just, I mean, but it's the most enjoyable thing that I do with Craig that I get to do with my darling husband. So um, we hope you're going to enjoy tonight's episode. We had Diabolic Parthenia in the house. Um, That's kind of rare, right, Craig? No doubt. I've been asking for years and it's like, nope. (laughs) <laughs> so, so we were really a, an honor yeah it was quite the honor we had ancillary diabolic mystic q and lady liz we had infernal max and his translator lady d the familiar scribe of course we had our beloved apparian and source and they were talking about the brand new hud they were talking about tear town I mean, there's a lot of good stuff. So you got to listen to this in its entirety. It is amazing. So you're going to enjoy it. And And we want to thank uh, all of y'all again just for being with us on this wonderful ride. And here's to 100 more episodes. Yeah, 401 subscribers. Go like and subscribe it at the end of this. And here's to another 100 episodes. Cheers, my darling. I can certainly introduce our beloved source from behind the fang, the creator of the podcast. Today, we're here for the 100th episode and we're here to celebrate. So we're taking questions. This is your exciting yet terrifying opportunity to do this live raw. So who's going first? Does the source, do you have anything you want to say? Well, I would like to say congratulations on the 100th episode. It's a, a really nice achievement, and I, I can't tell you how appreciative I am of you guys continuing this podcast. You know, I put this together, or I started the original podcast years ago with the intent of creating an information distribution system for the community You know, as I was working on things. But, you know, obviously my time is limited and it is better spent developing. So the fact that you guys picked this up and ran with it just means the world to me. So thank you. It is such an honor for us to do it and work with Diabolic Domino. We're just totally honored. Well, and we truly, when we got the offer to do the podcast, it was like, humbling almost so we're just glad to truly still be here yeah hopefully we're living up to you know everyone's expectations i think you're doing a great job myself thank you very much wow i'm totally honored thank you does our beloved apparian obron have anything to say I can certainly contribute, I hope. Uh, It has been my pleasure over the years to be very grateful for the teamwork and the number of individuals that have been involved in the many, many aspects of the development of the progeny system. Uh, And the community. And the community, yes. The community is is wonderful through and through. Uh, Yes, there have been differences of opinion. If there weren't, we wouldn't be inhuman so (laughs) on that note uh again i thank all of you i thank the entire community i thank all of the people who have been involved in the building and uh 
the assistance in putting together the 11 sims that currently uh, are progeny sims. They may have some different names, but uh, they're owned by both uh, the source and myself. And uh, we enjoy people coming into the system. Uh, we uh, have our meetings. The Diabolic Conclave has their meetings every Thursday in the evening. And uh, if we've been bad diabolics, we get told that. <laughs> and no oh, he is never back diabolics. <laughs> 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 but uh, as a general rule of thumb, it really is a pleasure to listen to these podcasts. Uh, and it is my hope that everybody who has questions doesn't fear sending questions to me or to any of the diabolics. Uh, we have a tendency to field those questions and the ones that we need to bring to the source's attention, we do so. But because he is attempting not only to deal with his real life, but also with second life, and the development of P5, it's uh, better if you come to us rather than directly to him, because we can usually uh, make it so that whatever is necessary for him to know about immediately or to take care of a problem immediately, we can bring that to his attention. Uh, and it cuts down on the number of IMs and uh, DMs, however we call them these days. We have so many different terms for messages, it drives me out of my mind what's left of it. Uh, but uh, again, thank you everybody out there in the community for everything that you do. It is most appreciated. Absolutely. I would like to completely agree with everything Oberon just said. Um, on the filtering requests for help and stuff through the Diabolics, I would also like to add, while obviously my my door is always open, especially for COL members, um, and you know, IMing me through the COL is, is always an option, when it comes to a lot of support cases, the Diabolics can get you results faster uh, because they're you know always here and always online and it's uh, one of their primary responsibilities so if they can tend to your your tickets themselves then you know usually it will get done faster than waiting for me to respond to two or three hundred ims that i might have sitting in my queue at any given point in time but more than that a lot of the messages I tend to get are of sort of a, a interpersonal nature between multiple vampires. And I have to say that the, the biggest suck on my time and motivation is when I get dragged into the middle of a conflict between multiple members of the community, especially when those members are ranking COL members, and I actually have to pay attention to both of them, or all of them, as the case may be. Having social issues such as, you know, abuse and stalking reports and, you know, behavioral issues filtered through the diabolics first gives them the opportunity to research the given point and gather information rather than distracting me and causing me to uh, basically get heart sick over the whole situation. And that zaps my productivity. So it, it's not just a matter of, of more work for me. It can be an, an emotional strain and I already have a great deal on my plate. So I'm not saying I don't want to hear from you. I'm not saying that you can't. I am me just Consider if it's something that maybe a diabolic can help with first before, you know, raising your hand to me, because there are thousands of you and one of me. I guess that's a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, I nine problems. And you don't want someone to be just, number 100. Mm -mm. Someone yeah. just commented that you shouldn't have to be a babysitter. I agree. <laughs> well, yeah. But, you know, I am sort of the father of the system, so everyone looks yeah. at me as daddy, you know. You know, uh, Oberon hit on about P5, and I think we should talk about that a little bit. Sure. You know, I know people think they understand the scope and scale of what's coming. Yeah, well, P5 is a complete ground-up redesign of the system, and that is not necessarily a redesign of the functional aspects 
uh, meaning like like clans and arch vampires and houses and the the application process and the GCSC and the 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 renegades and all all the social structures. It's not a change to how progeny works. It's a change to the underlying infrastructure. I, I started building progeny what almost thirteen years ago now, and uh, maybe even more. It's it, it's it's been a while. And you know, while I am a, a software developer as my day job, you know, I, I am I'm a programmer and a database designer and all that. Um, you know, my skills have improved considerably over the years. And the element, the various elements of progeny, the from from the vampire HUD, which has some of the oldest scripts in the system, the two actual oldest scripts are the original potency stones. And the altars, uh, the vampire altars. But the HUD itself has a lot of very old algorithms in it. Um, it, it. It has security holes. It has, um, you know, very serious inefficiencies. Because when I started building the system, I had sort of an idea of what I wanted it to be and what I wanted it to become. A lot of which has actually happened. Some of which is still on the drawing board. But there's a lot of infrastructure in place in the HUDs that simply doesn't need to be there. Uh, it, it actually is better handled on the back end of the system. So I have redesigned everything from ground up, still does basically the same things, adding in some new features and new abilities, but changing how everything works so it can be as efficient and streamlined as possible. The HUD itself is now much more lightweight. There's far less code in the scripts themselves. Um, the major issue and the major thing I am currently working on with the wire up and what, what a wire up is, is when I take the LSL script that it goes into the HUD or the various devices and I start completing the linkage between the buttons you guys click, the messages that goes on inside of the HUD or the device itself, and its communication with the game server in the background. P5, 99.99% of all of the API scripting is done, tested and working. The issues now I'm working on are simply making the in-world objects talk and work correctly with those APIs. The reason I say 99.999 and not 100% is I keep finding potential bugs and issues as I work on real world use test cases for these various scripts. You know, uh, the 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 most recent issue, and as I start before I distracted myself, that I'm working on right now is the rebuilt comm system. Um, we had some bad actors a while ago that figured out how to spoof HUD messages and cause vampires' HUDs to read that they are being attacked by somebody. And then the, the, the player then thinks, oh, I'm being bitten and I need to fight back and blah, 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 where the original person did not actually do any biting. They sent a spoof message to the HUD. That will no longer be possible because the HUDs do not talk together in the same way as they used to. They're not sending encrypted message traffic across a private comm channel. They'll, they still do what's called a ping, basically saying, um, for instance, if I'm sitting over here and I'm scanning Domino, and, uh, my HUD needs to send Domino's a HUD a ping to let it know that there may be incoming message traffic. And then Domino's HUD now will in turn call to the server to find out what that message traffic is rather than my HUD sending a direct message containing all of that information to his HUD. Um, there is an element of that which is slower marginally, but it's far more secure and far more efficient. Uh, further, I strictly reduce the of what's called linked messages, which allow the various scripts in the HUD and devices to communicate with the other scripts in, in, in the various devices. So overall, I've made uh, massive amounts of improvements on 
the speed and efficiency with which the devices work in world to reduce the overall weight of the HUD and the various devices on the sim that you're on, but mainly to make combat more snappy and efficient. Beyond that, I finally added in the infrastructure for Blood Magic, which will be uh, the ability to do various powers that are po powered by potency and blood, such as a vampire being able to heal corpus, which is your um, physical damage, um, by burning blood and potency in order to f heal the physical damage. So vampires can take two kinds of damage, bleeding damage and physical damage. And this is a necessity because of the introduction of Therianthropes and later um, uh, Slayers. So combat will be far more, I'm going to say interesting, you know, because there'll be various elements to manage and you can use your automatic vampire healing as, you know, back off a little bit and you slowly heal over time by burning blood and potency or consciously using blood magic to, uh, to bind to a button on your HUD and instantly heal a certain percent based on your age group and training and things like that. So, um, yeah. So overall, it's a redesign to make the system better, more efficient, and more stable, and at the same time, open the door to lots of new features. I, does that answer your question? Sorry, I went yeah. a long way around that bush. It, it, you also had to like, totally rebuild the back end as well. Oh, yeah. Everything. Yeah. All, 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 all the yeah. way down to the database. The the. the yeah. The, the Progeny production database, the main database that the system uses, was wildly inefficient and prone to issues because it was built ad hoc, piece by piece, over the course of a decade or more. And uh, so there are elements of it that I look at now and think, what the hell was I thinking? And what I was thinking at the time is I had a problem I had to fix, and I found the fastest possible way to fix it. Well, now I've gone through and tried to make um, all of that far more efficient and easy to manage, taking out things that are what I call database weights, things that eat up a lot of data or horsepower on the database um, in order to make everything more efficient. An example of this is currently in, in the existing project, in Progeny 3.7 or whatever we're at, uh, the, there is a table for each avatar and then there's a table for vampires. And then there's a couple other support tables for like bite logs and things like that. And they're all constantly being read and locked whenever a vampire bites somebody or does a self scan. There's, there's a lot of activity crossing and locking those multiple tables. One of the nice and nifty things about P5's database is the um, frequently changing data such as your blood level or your potency, um, you know, those things have been moved into what I call a hot swap table. So you still have a vampire record in a vampire table, and you still have an avatar record in an avatar table, and you now actually have what's called a player record in the player table, but those things don't change very much. When you go into combat, or maybe when you log into the HUD, I, I, I might actually shift it to that. But right now, it's it's when you go into combat, your HUD goes into what's called high efficiency mode, and it moves all of your vital stats into the hot swap table, which typically has only the information for all of the players that are currently acti actively doing some kind of activity. So instead of 75,000 records being in that table, there might only be 1,000 records in that table. And there's one specific row for all of your specific data. This way, we remove um, all of these collisions when you have multiple vampires fighting and each one's HUD is trying to get access to that table and basically say, nope, you can't touch it because somebody else is. So now there's one row that needs to be edited for each particular vampire, if that makes sense. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's way cool. faster. It's way faster. So Aaron is asking... Um about training you mentioned training is there going to be a thing with uh in the hud like skilling or something like that 
Um, we are o- we are open for that, uh, but there there is a built-in experience system in the blood magic section and in the Therian Thropes hunting. Um, but it's not fully implemented. It will probably be released and and updated. I would actually like to have something like a crafting system at some point. Uh, it's not in, going to be in the P5 initial release. So uh, by training, I actually mean you know experience using a given cool in combination with your your particular age group as a vampire or your lineage as a therianthrope. Um, therianthropes are are far more affected by their I guess time and grade. You know how how long it's been since they've been slain, whereas vampires are more about their overall age. Uh, or rather their age group, which is more... I've kind of moved away from doing uh, ca- dynamic calculations based on your actual age, because that changes so frequently. Doing an, an age group uh, makes the bonuses a whole lot easier to calculate and, and you know speeds up the combat process a lot. So um, as for built-in tutorials in the HUD... Uh, I had not thought about that, and I obviously can't do it in this first beta release, but that's actually a really good idea, and the new HUD has a AMS button, which lets you open up a web browser to, to maintain various settings, such as your gender and your um, you know titles and things like that. Um, so we could very easily put in... You know, have user recorded videos for tutorials on how to do different things and actually put that right in the HUD where the user clicks the button, it opens up a web browser, and one of the options is help. That's that's kind of a really neat idea. And I'm going to look at that, but I, I'm really trying to get this out by Halloween, so I'm not going to distract myself with adding it now, but I'm going to add that to my to-do list. Well, and Ming and I would be more than happy to help you with all the tutorial videos that you need. That'd be great. Thank you. Any other questions? It sounds like a really exciting Halloween coming. Yeah, I'm doing my best, guys. <laughs> if I can get it out on time, it'll be great. If not, it might be a little bit late, but it'll it's coming. It's I'm getting so close, I can taste it. That is awesome. Awesome news. To be honest, I wanted to have the beta out already, but, you know, but real life keeps getting in the way. I may ask, will you have like a beta testing process at all for yeah. certain individuals? Yeah, well, the beta process, this is probably a good discussion point to have here. The beta process, as I typically like to do it, starts out with what I would call a pre-alpha beta. And basically what that is, is I give a copy of whatever it is to the Diabolics. This is so they can help me find any any specific security holes I may have forgotten, such as the ability to read the scripts. You know, I've actually done that once before. Um, you know, uh, make sure that you know everything is on the whole working correctly. We usually do that over a day or two. Uh, just you know, hammer it real quick. Make sure there's nothing super obvious that's broken. Um, because as the developer, you often do things the way you intend it to be done, but when somebody else gets their hands on it, they start doing things to it you never expected, and, you know, things can pop up. The next step is sometimes I will do what's called a closed alpha. Um, For this particular release, I will probably not do this, but this would simply be releasing it to the Arch Vampires and the Diabolics to do sort of a, um, a shakedown. You know, just, okay, the Diabolics had a crack at it. We've made sure it's not obviously broken. You know, adding the Arch Vampires in lets um, each of them give feedback that might be relevant to their bloodline or their clans or whatnot. Um, at that point, we go into the first open alpha or beta, and I do a scaled rollout. What I will usually do with the first round of public beta is this would include the Arch Vampires, the Diabolics, and all COL members of usually the Archbishop and Cardinal levels. Um, once we've run that through for a little while, we will then run another round of beta where we include the, the bishops and maybe the... Um, 
the the Vicars and stuff. We just kind of work our way down the list until we've managed to find and fix every possible bug and every possible, um, hey, this could be better if you did this kind of thing. So we work our way down the list until, you know, all of the COL members that, you know, are supposed to be part of a beta get a chance. That said, sometimes that beta process gets truncated as in, oh, we went through a round of betas and we included the cardinals and the archbishops, but we've pretty much hammered out every possible issue because this is a simple device. So, or whatever. And I will simply release it at that point. There's no point in doing additional betas and delaying everybody getting their hands on it when you know, there's really not much more to find. In the case of P5, there may be a truncated beta for the initial HUDs because I want to get them out. But this also includes a rebuild update for all of the existing devices. So all of those are also going to need beta testing and, and whatnot. To that point, um, there is, I guess, something that's kind of important. And this is the first time that I have ever done this particular methodology. And that is Progeny 5 has its own separate database it's it's completely rebuilt it's a completely new system so when i do these alpha and beta tests um, for the huds i plan to do them sidelong with production progeny which means any vampire that is involved in the early beta testing uh they will have no effect on other vampires in in progeny when they're using that device unless that other vampire is also using the p5 system it'll be a completely isolated system uh after each round of beta testing we will reset that system re-import everything from production progeny i have an automated process for that it just brings everything across it does take about four hours to run that process uh, because there's a crap ton of data in Progeny's database. But it merges everything over, reformats everything to the new system, and then it's ready to go again. We switch it back on and do the next round of testing. So basically, while we're in beta, it's just kind of like a dreamland. You're out there and you're you're pretending to be whatever and, and whatnot. But as soon as we convert it to production... P5 or P37 goes away. P5 becomes a master database. I will still maintain a a. I'm gonna actually I like that. I'm gonna call it the Dreamscape copy, which is a will be continue to be a testing environment. So if I need to do, let's say for the the potency apparatus, when I'm ready to release that, uh, we can release it on the beta side. And everyone can test it without affecting people on the main system. But it, it's really critical for the HUD testing because I don't want people using some of the advanced combat stuff in the uh, the P5 system to get a hugely unfair advantage over people who do not have it yet, if that makes any sense. It sure does. And uh, on that note, thank you so much, our source. Um... I would like at this time, if it's possible, for Ancillary Diabolic Liz to give us a briefing on the PLS. Hello, hello. Greetings to all. A pleasure to be here and congratulations to Behind the, Behind the Fang podcast for the number 100 finally. Thank you very kindly. That is a huge honor to even be here. My wife and I are, like, humbled. <laughs> um, regarding the PLS, there has been a slight change. As you already know, for many years, I've been working with Diabolic Cassie. Nowadays, the main change is it goes directly through our Hyperion. I am there to assist as well. The next change, uh, it is that we have a new committee. So now when we receive a case via the PLS, of course, it gets overseen by a diabolic eye. 
and depending if it doesn't have any sensitive information, it goes to the committee. And the committee is, um, the committee has uh, the two new chief justices, for those who doesn't know, we have Arch Zoe and Arch Babu as the new uh, chief justices for the Arch and our Infernal, which is and Hope, she is the first, which is Lady Robin, Arch Advisor. So they all work together to come up with a resolution regarding the case, and according to the resolution, it, it moves forward to um, the PLS, as it usually does, or it goes many of the cases that we have um, are directly managed by the Diabolic Conclave. Any major decision is uh, made with approval of everybody. It's not just one Diabolic, it is a group decision. Those Thank are the two main news regarding the PLS. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Diabolic Liz. Um, the other thing, and I don't mean to uh, override you, <laughs> uh, Craigie, uh, but I have a few questions myself that I'd like to bring up. And one of those is uh, Diabolic Parth. Uh, can you give us any more information on how the magazine is progressing these days? Yeah, well, we have a great new um, Infernal Lady Bomb Bomb, who's kind of coordinating a lot of the graphics for it and we're planning we always celebrate um an arch vampire every month we usually feature one each uh, i'm sorry each issue and so the one that's coming up next is going to be arch lily uh and uh we're also featuring the um the uh um different guilds within progeny and trying to you know, highlight what everybody does and make sure that everybody is acknowledged. And we're also trying to move over into the web so that we can, uh, you know, maybe get stories out. I was saying monthly before, you know, maybe try to get um, smaller stories out in a more um, frequent basis. So, yeah, that's about it. Okay, thank you, Diabolic Park. Now, uh, one thing I'd like to mention, and that is Diabolic Mystique, Mystique Q, however you wish to pronounce her name, that is entirely up to you, and she will correct you if she thinks it's wrong. Anyway, uh, she has been the architect of Terror Town, which has been put together for the benefit of uh, Second Life, and uh, Mystique, could you please uh, give us a rundown? Hi, everybody, and congratulations, of course, on 100th pass. Um, Terratown is a full region, uh, 12 rides by, I mean, like, you know, I went and rode rides, and um, the rides we have is the best I've seen. Uh, there's 37 gifts to hunt for, and they're all free. Um, we're on the featured... Uh, Events and destinations. Um, we have live entertainment. In fact, it's running right now. Um, live DJs. We have performances coming up. We have live singers. Um, and it's all like we have donation kiosks on the region for making strides against breast cancer. Because this is one thing that touches uh, a lot of us. And it has touched... Uh, my family and all that so you know a lot of things that i do um for progeny and this is charity related so that's how tarot town is going thank you so much mr q and now diabolic domino you who are uh, the person who has more or less made these uh, podcasts come to life. Uh, I'd also love to hear from you about how things are going with the Scribes Guild. 
the scribes uh, working on the back end kind of like the marines you know first in last out doing a, a thankless job a long time ago we noticed that there were no scribes and <laughs> decided to make the scribes guild and i got to give credit to uh, former vampire uh, maybe you guys will recognize her name rambling gal who was the uh, Graves Design's single scribe and did a lot of hard work to get things started. And uh, we picked it up where she left off. Um, asked the GCSC if they would like some scribes, and they voted yes, and uh, the rest is history. Now it's a pretty good-sized team. Uh, we've got translators translating into, what do we have, like seven different languages now? Uh, familiar scribe, we have fairy scribes. A um, lot of lot of hard workers, and we really appreciate them. Thanks for asking. You are most welcome, Diabolic Domino. It is always a pleasure. Uh, I would like to make note at this time that Diabolic Antonia is uh, not been around that much lately because of some personal things going on in her life that involve medical issues. Uh, and, but uh, she is still in the background, still making sure that the Usher's Guild functions the way it's supposed to. And uh, I truly miss her. Uh, she's one of the very, very few people that can yell at me and I go, oops, what did I do now? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, we're keeping her, we're keeping her grapefruit spoons polished for her while she's away. <laughs> much respect towards towards the darkness she is one classy lady that is for sure yes she is yes she is and she has such a wonderful command of old english she knows very well how to put me in my place with old english which i thoroughly enjoy uh we've had uh, many many debates she and i uh it's uh, quite quite intriguing anyway uh that's about all I have to say at the moment. Uh, Craigie, Ming, please uh, take over uh, where I left up. <laughs> well, great. So we were saying we were going to take questions from the audience, and I do have one for Diabolic Liz. Um, I'm going to admit some names here from Amdis. If I was attacked, by example, by an arch on Progeny Land, and I was living on Progeny Land, and I had a home there. What would happen to the vampire who was attacked by the arch? As I was living under blank blank during the time, and I was attacked by arch so-and-so. I omitted the names for obvious reasons. Okay. Well, first of so, all, so what would happen? What would happen to the vampire that was attacked, or what would happen to the vampire? What would happen to the arch that did the attacking? Okay, well, let's just go with both because she. The question it just asked, what would happen to the vampire okay. attacked? So I think both would probably all be right. the best. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Oh, I thought the source wanted to respond to that. Uh, no, no, because all, you, uh, you you guys are really driving the PLS, so I'd like to hear the, the official policy answer. <laughs> I have mine. I can chime in afterwards if you like. Dun, dun, dun. Well, uh, <laughs> first of all, at Progeny Lands, you cannot bite anyone. First, first rule above any. So I actually offered this person to get in touch with me. If she wants to present, I don't know the details of the case, but if she wants to move forward with a case via the PLS, she's more, she or he is more than welcome. Okay. If attacked by an arch, that will hurt for sure. Getting beaten by any elder of the system will hurt. It's hurt, folks. Okay, so I have a question then for anyone who wants to answer. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and throw in, yes, throw in my reasons. I absolutely, absolutely agree with everything that was said there. Um, arches should not be attacking 
anybody that that is on Prodigy Land because Arch is above above and beyond anybody else should follow and adhere to Diabolic Law. Um, if if an Arch was found to be uh, engaging in abusive behavior, such as you know stalking and or trying to drive certain individuals or groups from the system, then they would be as liable as any other player to possible punitive measures. There are a few ex-arches who engaged in abhorrent behavior, and they are gone from the system uh, because of said abhorrent behavior. Now, this was a very, very long time ago. So I would like to assure the community that just because somebody is an arch um, does not mean that they get away scot-free. That said, uh, if there is a role play element to whatever is going on, I may personally step out. So if if there is a war going on between your clan and the Arches clan, they still should obey diabolic law and not attack on Progeny Land because that is a front to the diabolics. But if they were to attack you out in a club or something, it seems like a waste of their ability but they would not necessarily be punished for it as long as it is a, um, I, I guess, a legitimate attack, if that makes any sense. So that, that's my two cents. Oh, totally. That is, that's just great, because that makes a lot of sense and sheds a lot of light on the whole aspect of it. So as long as it's role play. Okay. Um, Diabolic Liz, I, I just have a question. Um, regarding the complaint process to the diabolics how would that go about or how would one assert themselves to file a complaint for filing um, a complaint you can go to the website that has been graded by the source maybe i can type down on the chat and you will Perfect. find Thank a you. tag that says complaint and you can file your complaint over there okay perfect thank you so much just for everybody that wanted some information on that i will post the link in the chat or she got it awesome and it's i gotta say it's really been a shocking turn of events. Um, we have a guest here I have been trying to get on the podcast for a long time, and I just want to thank personally Diabolic Parth for being here with us today. <laughs> yes, it's very exciting. Maybe she'll come back and do it. A solo. <laughs> well, you know, it's the hundred. You guys going to have to raise her up. So I you know, know, right? What do you do when it's the hundredth, right? But yeah, well, she just adores Craig, so I'll let him go ahead and butter her up after the show for this. <laughs> my God. Craig, how many times you had your lips sewn, huh? I was going to say my poor lips. Sheesh. I know. <laughs> well, I have a question then for anyone that wants to answer. What is your favorite guest and episode? Ooh, exciting. I mean, as far as popularity goes, it always seems to be uh, when we have the Aperion on. Yes, but I mean the Aperion and the source, your individual opinions on which one you like best. I think that's an unfair question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I have to agree. I have to agree. I got a bucket of napalm here. I'm waiting for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you look I'll just at the hide stats, this coach. if I look at the stats <laughs> on our channel, episode one, the very first podcast, um, is number one in views, 988 views, which is pretty amazing. We'll break a thousand one day. That's it. That's where it all began. Yes. It's a great one to watch. And the shill and I can fight over whether it was his popularity or or, or mine because I was on that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it was it's definitely yours. 
Nobody yeah. likes me. <laughs> You're going to eat some worms. <laughs> um, is it possible for you to read the list of the top like five or top ten diabolic domino? Yeah, you got it. So, number one, um, 988 views, the very first episode one. Number two is episode 39. It's a Spanish broadcast with Arch Rochil. And that one is at 895. Way to go, Arch Rochil. Thank you. Um, nice. Number three, Oberon. And this one is at 622. So there's a um, number three right there. Number six was with Arch Lucian at 564. Or, sorry, was that? It was episode six, and that's uh, fourth on our list. And uh, rounding up, number five was a breaking news episode done by you, Ming, and uh, that was at 538. I'm not, don't remember exactly what that was, but way to go. Yes, my Those wife, Lois Lane. Wow, oh my gosh, normally they're throwing eggs at my door. I am shocked. Thank you, everyone. I made the cut. Um. <laughs> I always had this question as well, because I've seen it both ways. Is it behind the fang, single fang, or behind the fangs, plural? <laughs> it's a hillbilly vampire, right? <laughs> well, when I, when I first created the podcast before you guys took it over, it was behind the fang, singular. You know, I just thought it had a nice poetic ring to it. Ah, I like it because that's how I've always been pronouncing it, and I was like, "It's behind the fang." You know that always, fang? Go ahead. I always put fangs plural, so I'm glad we got this clarified. Thank you. I suppose it can be all things to all people, so whatever makes you happy. Um, <laughs> I, I was just curious: do I still have the original theme song that I created for the podcast years ago. I had a, an intro and outro for it. I think it'd be in a great designs. You guys talk. I'm going to see if I can find this. It might be fucking okay, one, thing, one thing I would like to do is thank uh, our uh, Spanish translator. Uh, that's a combination of Max, who is broadcasting in Spanish, I believe. And is that Lady Beauregard who's doing the translations? That's it, Lady D. She's our familiar scribe. Excellent, excellent. And I'd like to thank them profusely. I mean, it's it's wonderful that we have uh, somebody who can help our Spanish community understand some of the idiocies of our English-speaking community. And I speak of myself in that regard. <laughs> I am always honored to help the community. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And thank Max very much. Uh, I actually have uh, the Spanish broadcast going on on one of my other computers here, and uh, it's quite, quite efficient. I might have to say that I created a website that was the first bilingual because I have an IT degree myself. Bless you. And I did an English and Spanish one. So I know exactly what you mean when you talk about the lingo. Yeah, it's it's uh, magnificent in how we've managed to bring in so many different people from so many different countries, uh, and the the database is just uh, immense at this point in time. I do realize that there's a lot of folks that have allowed themselves to go into coma in anticipation of P5 coming out, and there's a lot of folks that have been coming back now that we've eliminated some of the more troublesome characters that were involved in the system. So it's uh, it's it, we're definitely growing. We're certainly not shrinking. No, oh, that's amazing. And as this being, community is skyrocketed, and as having the honor of being the first familiar scribe, and helping Infernal Cameron and Infernal Ming, and Abraham Obron yourself, uh, and the source growing the familiars. It is great in seeing the group grow in the way it is. And I'm Absolutely. glad to help and be a mentor to it. You know, this is a perfect opportunity. You can describe how would someone go about um, getting themselves familiar? What's the process? 
Well, the process is one, abiding by the mas the law of the masquerade. You know, that's the main thing. Knowing that you have a good sire and a good family to go to that will be there for you in guiding you in the process. And knowing, as a familiar, I've known about progeny since it started. Uh, I've kept it quiet. When I was given the honor of being a familiar scribe, I will always be a familiar because I want that part to be included. And I thank the source for creating the familiar group uh, for us that want to remain humans. Uh, just knowing that you're part of a community that is very active is a key. Uh, I love being a familiar. I love guiding other familiars and helping them be in it. Um, and I would have to say getting people more involved in with the familiars, it's we're just one big happy family thanks to the source. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, the other thing I'd like to mention today is it's Atra Shield's birthday, which I will be attending his birthday celebration. But I'm also grateful to the fact that he is now the curator of the development of the museum. I understand there's a lot of construction going on, and uh, it's wonderful that he is has taken on this responsibility. Uh, I'd also like to thank Arch Woden for his development of the War Sim. Progeny War is available to everybody uh, who wishes to use it to fight and bite without <laughs> worrying about us pushing the dust button. Uh, so it's open to all Progeny players. Uh, at some point or another, when the Therianthrope HUD is released, uh, that will also be one of the hunting grounds for the Therianthropes. So it will be interesting to develop the role play between the Therianthropes and the vampires when it comes to it on the war sim. Uh, it's all about role play, is what we're attempting to promote and develop within the system. Uh, on many other lands. Uh, like I said, we have 11 sims. Uh, and on those 11 sims, some of them are private residences, and those private residences are protected by the fact that they are owned by progeny. Uh, if you live outside, that's where the PLS comes into play. <laughs> uh, so keep in mind that uh, we invite everybody to come and play in the system. Uh, and as has been mentioned, the biggest issue seems to be masquerade and the definition thereof. Uh, within Second Life itself, masquerade is very important. Uh, when we're discussing things in our Discord servers and our other servers, it's not quite as important. But one thing everybody needs to understand that when it comes to private direct messages or private IMs, we have no authority over them, nor do we want to see them, because that just adds to the minutia that we don't need to deal with. So on that note, do we have any other questions from? Uh, yes, Craig? I do. Go I, right have, I have two questions. OK, go ahead. One is that it was brought to my attention by an arch, which I'm not going to name, and wanted to know why having a familiar, there be, them being that familiar sire, why as an arch they couldn't revive that familiar. It was They asked me how they could do it, and I go, well, diabolics, the only way I know. But this particular familiar is at a 5% the last time I spoke to the Arch a few days ago. And they couldn't revive their familiar. I'll go, well, that's, uh, 
That's a technical question for our source. Uh, I mean, every now and again, he revives all the familiars. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, with my HUD, I can revive an individual. Uh, but uh, come to think of it, I don't know how we would revive a familiar outside of uh, your doing it, uh, our source. Can you answer that question? Yeah, I was actually just trying to think about that. Um, and that may also be an issue in P5 I'm going to have to address. As far as I know, the draft of life should also work on a familiar, but it is po entirely possible that it doesn't. I don't remember if there is an avatar type flag in that script. Um, it very well could be. I, I need to investigate that, and I need to make sure that the draft of life does work on familiars. And in P5, there is a healing mechanic for them, as well as a feeding mechanic to, to heal them. So there, there's lots of ways to potentially heal them in P5 once it gets out. But um, as for in the existing system, I know that our diabolic tools allow for the healing of them. And I, I suspect that the draft of life potion should also heal them. I just don't know for sure. Um, I tested it. It does. It does. It does. Okay. Yes. Okay. The draft of life, not the VRD. The vampire potion would probably kill right. them. But the the yeah. the uh, the draft of they life. Did. It tried the the. Oh, I'm sorry. The arch did mention that they tried a tank. Like I said, I, and they did try other methods, but it didn't work because the person was still. At five percent humanity, so huh. on their part they couldn't they could not revive the person. So I direct. I mean, being that I'm the familiar scribe, they came to me. So I'm yeah. glad they did. Yeah, that that definitely sounds like a potential bug. So um, yeah, it should be reported to us, and we can look into it. But okay. as Domino said, if he's tested it and the DOL works on familiars, which it should, uh, I, I do understand that it's possible that they don't because I didn't think about that when we made the familiar hut. It very well may not. But if it's been tested and it does, but it doesn't work in some specific case, that may be an issue I need to fix. So um, if, if Domino or somebody, if somebody can be given that familiar's UUID so it can be put into my task list, I, I will take a look at it as soon as I can. I will mention it to the arch that contacted me. To, yeah, to just have somebody file yeah. have somebody file a ticket so we can look mm -hmm. into it. No problem. He's also, here. he's here in the chat. He's saying it did work, but it only brought them back to fifty percent. So maybe he needs two potions. Yeah, the more potions you use, the higher you no, go. He's saying no, 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 it didn't. Not what he said. He said. I, I will okay. I will give it a try as soon as I get a chance. Uh, they are at fifty percent when he gave them the potion. Is that correct, Archbishop? Uh, how many potions did he take? None. It, None. As, as, I, as I recall, with humans, with quick, uh, one healing if they're dead, uh, which I believe a five percent would count as for a human, but because they're a familiar, they don't quite go all the way dead. Uh, there. So uh, a a it, the the potion would treat them as being dead, which I believe only brings them back to fifty percent. But a subsequent potion should bring them all the way back up. So drinking a second one should top them off. But I don't remember; it's been a, quite a long time since I actually looked at that code. Um, I will take a look at it, and if it's not, I will fix it. Okay. okay. Our source, it, if I may, I have a question from Aaron. Sure. Um, in regarding to the addition of the theory in HUD, um, is it the thought that the fighting will be more vampire on Therian instead of the same races or just going to kind of see what happens? Like a vampire versus there, werewolf kind of war? Or? There, there are two potential answers to that question. And to be honest, I'm not sure either of them are accurate because I've never been able to predict exactly what the community is going to do with the tools that I give them. So I'm going to answer it in two ways. The first way is the initial intent. The initial intent of vampires, therianthropes, and slayers was to replace 
I guess what I see as Bloodlines monetary restrictions. Uh, when I played Bloodlines way back when, before I got sick of it and started Progeny, I, I was always um, very annoyed with the feeling that, you know, Mars had his hand in my pocket. You know, it's like if I wanted to stay alive, yeah. I either had to feed on unbitten people or by blood or by a, a, a amulet. Um, at the same time, when I tried briefly a game called Hunger, it was extremely easy to feed and that's the way progeny was originally built is that you know feeding's easy but you know you're going to lose your blood if you just don't participate or if you um get into combat blah 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 so my original intent was that it would be easy and non-intrusive on non-players for vampires to feed vampires should be able to feed easy but the thrill of feeding would be introduced by the fact that the time when you're feeding is when you as a vampire are most vulnerable. So feeding in public is the best time for slayers and therianthropes to attack you. That said, the purpose, the original purpose of therianthropes is to reduce the food supply. So therianthropes go out, feed on humans. Now that has changed to some extent with the modern therian concept that we've ended up going with. It's no longer directly intended to reduce the food supply. However, it's still designed in such a way that this could happen. If Therians decide they're going to go around feeding on humans, they do far more massive bodily damage than vampires do. Vampires suck like with a sippy straw, whereas Therianthropes rip you open and eat your heart, I think. So okay. vampires farm humans, Therianthropes reduce the food supply. Slayers, on the other hand, are intended to be a threat to both, being a threat primarily to Therianthropes, because Therianthropes are more physically the immediate threat to uh, humans, whereas vampires are more insidious and have to be sort of hunted and stamped out. So the three work together to act as a balance to make feeding and interacting with the mortal world as a supernatural exciting. So that was the original intent. Long story short, yes, I intended vampires and therianthropes to be antagonistic to one another because their, their role in the world is sort of diametrically opposed. You know, therianthropes eat humans, vampires farm humans, it's just like the farmer versus the wolf, if that makes any sense. So that was the original really? intent. The current design, Therianthropes are more based around rage and Edelon. So they are either kind of nature spirits or um, you know more shamanistic, I guess, in nature. Uh, they are still, if they don't manage their rage or enhance their Edelon, uh, a danger to the humans around them. Flat out. Uh, Therianthropes can lose control and, and wolf out and basically wipe out all the humans around them. And I am working on a mechanic for them to go out, quote, into the wild and release their beast to hunt to build up their Edelon and reduce their rage. Um, that's probably going to be in the second release. Uh, so they're not going to be quite as antagonistic. And given all of the discussion we have had with the existing existing Therians in the community that we flat out have mixed clans we have vampire clans that do not their their Therian membership do not want to leave so what we're going to end up happening is while a Therian cannot be a genetic part of a bloodline because they're not vampires they do not share the arch vampire's blood. They they have to basically become human and then turn into a therianthrope in order to to be a, a progeny therianthrope. Um, they're they're not. They don't share the the the, the vampire bloodline because vampires are undead and therians are uber alive. Yeah, you know, they're they're diametrically opposed metaphysically. So, but there is nothing that stops a therian from being a member of a house or a clan. And nothing that stops, um, you know, a vampire from joining a Therian pack or tribe. Um, the, the, those will be possible. Um, so, 
I guess what I'm getting at here is if you have a vampire clan that has therianthropes in it, those therianthropes are most likely going to be the foot soldiers because therianthropes can dish out a massive amount of physical damage. They also heal uh, in a way similar but not exactly the same as vampires do. Uh, vampires are are more immortal than therianthropes. Therianthropes who are slain using a vulnerability kind of start over to some extent. So the longer they stay alive, the more power they build up, but they can be reset to zero. Whereas vampires basically keep going on and on until they are permanently slain or dusted. So uh, there's still a lot of this that's in flux because I haven't quite worked out all of the mathematics for it and how the algorithms are going to work. And this first beta release and first production release is going to generate a lot of player feedback that will shape how this develops in the future. Right now I have what I have built based on the feedback I have. So long story short, I expect there to be conflict between vampires and slayer or vampires and therianthropes, but I do not expect that to be the norm and the overall it's not going to be enforced. If that, if that makes sense, it's really going to be up to the players. And I do see there being Therian clans that are opposed to vampires and blah, 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 and vice versa. I also see them working together and, and, you know, everything is possible. Well, that sounds just great. It sounds awesome, actually. I can't wait to see what happens with the whole theory. And yeah, the, the 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 real difficulty I'm still trying to nail down is the interaction between the corpus and the blood, uh, and the healing process and the regeneration process. And um, I need to get that last bit done, and I need to get the HUD HUD to HUD comms get the bugs worked out of that. And I think we're about ready for the initial release. But right now I keep getting crashes or, or HUD conflicts that it's like I click the button and then something starts to happen and then nothing happens. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is uh, yes. Yeah. So the fun part on. of it now. <laughs> yeah. And it's the, the vampire HUD and the Slayer HUD in some way, or vampire, vampire HUD and the Therian HUD in some ways work almost identically. In other ways, they're very different. So, uh, but the underlying infrastructure has to be the same because they have to be able to talk to one another to initiate a combat. So it's it's complicated and it's like making my hair fall out. Very well, we don't want like a lot of work. We don't want your hair to fall out. And if I can interject for a moment, because one of my suggestions regarding the interface or the uh, what, what can happen between the Therianthropes and the vampire clans, not the bloodlines, but the clans, would be that Therianthropes and clans can create alliances with each other. And that is something that has yet to be discussed in great detail, but it is one of my suggestions, and uh, it's a distinct possibility that it could happen. And that actually is MP5. Am I still on mute? No, I'm not mute. Uh, so there, there is, that's something I actually haven't talked about a great deal. There is an alliances system uh, with MP5, which was originally built for, it actually exists in, in Project 3.7. It's just there's no infrastructure to actually activate it. But the tables are there. And the idea is that it, you know, any sovereign entity, that be a clan or a tribe or a, pack and a house etc they're kind of equivalent units to some extent they just work slightly differently any sovereign unit can establish a a treaty with another sovereign unit this can be declaration of war this can be a a, a what i call a nap a non-aggression pact this can be an alliance and that will feed into a friend or foe system that's in the hud so when you scan somebody uh, and they are in a clan, a house, or a tribe that is allied with your clan, it's going to read as an ally. You know, uh, if you scan somebody and your clan is at war with them, you will see them as an antagonist or, you know, enemy. So I think that's going to be something that adds a little bit to the system. 
at least for combat, because we we often have people attacking people, and it turns out that they're actually in the same you know clan or group. This will give you give you more information as to whether or not somebody's a friend or foe without having to identify which house they're in if they're actually you shouldn't actually have that information. Does that make sense? Sure does. Yeah. Oh, also along with that is a, a new uh, um, uh, a titling system. You know, uh, this was always originally intended to be the case. Right now, vampires get a title. It's a single text field in their vampire record. Uh, Therianthropes also have this. The title that appears when somebody scans you is currently kind of static. It gets set and then it stays there until something changes it. Uh, With the new system, you have titles that are associated with system roles, such as Sovereign, or Arch Vampire, or Ambassador, or Proxy, or, you know, Princeps, you know, these are system level, Infernal, you know, there are system level roles, we all know. Um, There will also, each clan, each house, each pack, each tribe, can define its own roles, uh, within that unit and apply those roles to people within those units themselves. So you might have a prince or a knight or a bishop or a you know a hunter or a gatherer or whatever you're, you you dream up that you can put in there and then you can apply it to your membership. That membership can then choose which of their available tags they want to be their active one to show when somebody scans them. So uh, I think that will be kind of neat for like when you're having a, a clan meeting or whatnot to have everyone display their you know their actual internal rank if that makes any sense. So it's a minor it's a minor thing. It's just something I've wanted to get into the system for a long time to let people dis- define their own. That's really roles. Cool. I just put up a graphic uh, on the table behind us of an old progeny HUD that did have that feature in it. It was called Diplomacy. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to zoom in on that, put it on the channel. Yeah, I just zoomed right in on it. That's awesome. Yep, that that was the original. That's when I first put the... uh... The, I, I built the infrastructure for this this subsystem a long, long time ago. I just never developed the code to make it work. Back then, it just had the table. And I think that was that the original, the HUD you're looking at there is like, it's like the second HUD. That That is, yeah. a, that is the last HUD graphic that I created myself with my really terrible, uh, you know, uh, Photoshop skills. <laughs> you know? uh, it did evolve. Into the, the the current HUD, you know, I think we've we've kept some of that theming, but uh, yeah, that that the diplomacy was in its most basic form existed in the that original HUD, but because it was never fully fleshed out to to work, especially because we I think we, I can't remember if we added clans or we added houses, but something got added that messed everything up. So I just never put it back in the new HUD because you know I had not at the time made it work but yep it, it is the same button even uh it's just the the graphic but the uh the you know, of course the shape is is, right. is is different but yeah or the uh, the the button shape is different in color but yeah yeah that is i for, I completely forgot about that thank you for sharing glad to not that i want to go ahead and have your hair fall off michelle but as far as the war sim, is there a way for a familiar to be able to interact without losing their humanity if they wanted to participate in actual combat? In combat? Um, yeah, okay, I, 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 I'm, I obviously do not have the time to, to implement this in this current push but i like your idea and what would you think about something like a familiar knife fight like uh the familiars they're mortal i mean they yeah they're 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 basically ghouls they're they're drinking a little vampire blood every now and then to heal to be healed but what if what if the familiars could have like an actual weapons fight 
on the war sim that is sort of like a gladiator games that is the vampires just watch and vampires can can put or enter a familiar into the contest and then the familiars fight for the honor of their clan or whatnot yeah that sounds and, great <laughs> and they, we would just have a weapon that i mean it could either be lethal or not you know that could be up to you know the the yeah. clans who sponsor the the, mm-hmm. the quote games and of course the question then becomes if it's a lethal combat, if it's a lethal combat and the, 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 your sponsored familiar is slain, what happens? Do they remain slain? Do they need to be revived as if, like with a draw to life through magic? Uh, or do they need to be made into a vampire at that point if they are going to be brought back? You know, I don't I, know. That's a, there that's some a question. familiar, but that, that it, I, cause it, it does come up. You know, they, oh, you know, because we would like to go ahead and also be in some sort of, you know, part of the role play of, of the battle, of the conquest, of all that sort of thing. So it's like, what better time than to ask now? <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, I also would like to note that uh, the war sim, the progeny familiar group is allowed on that sim. Okay. Uh, but only, But only to watch. At the moment, because we have yet to establish any rules regarding what they can do. Although CCS is available on that sim, which that, gives them the ability to fight that's with. A, yeah, that's a good point. You could actually, without me developing a progeny level combat for the for the familiars, uh, you know, in the meantime, you guys could absolutely do the CCS and just have them defined as being human. And, and, you know, as long as, you know, the vampire powers that be vote this as, you know, legal in the world of the vampires, you know, decide how you want these contests to work and then run them. And then I'll get, you know, the progeny part of it done as soon as I can, you know, because I definitely want familiars and or actually familiars will probably end up using something like slayer weapons only to maybe a lesser effect Mm -hmm. uh because they do not have familiars do not have any any quote powers uh in and unto themselves they can they can be fed vampire bloods to ghoul them and therefore heal them but they uh they they don't like naturally regenerate or um at some point maybe they need to have a scan you know, maybe once they've had enough vampire blood, they can smell uh, vampires or familiars or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'll get some thought to that, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, the only the only scan is of ourselves, and right, you know, and Status. only seeing when we get when we get attacked at the moment of attack is the right. only time we see somebody else's name on, on our hood. Yeah, yeah. So maybe there's something we can do there that. Or maybe even after a, a familiar drinks a little vampire blood for a period of time, while that blood is healing them, they get some, you know, get some extra powers. But maybe we can make that addictive. The more you do it, the more you need, kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like a I do want to. I do want to add when Arch Woden does the ravage, he uses the the combat HUD. That's equal for everybody. The Ravage HUD uh, instead of the other ones, so even familiars can participate in the Ravage. We'll definitely be Ooh. going by Arch's Ravage to see if I can get some lessons. Well, I like but... Aaron said. Familiar mm-hmm. fights, winners get oh. turned. <laughs> oh no, no, I'm not turning. <laughs> I like being the familiar scribe. (laughs) I don't want to lose that. We've all tried, trust me. Oh, so has Max. He's trying to convince me to turn. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. Uh Uh-uh. I like helping other familiars. And I am honored with that title. Well, you do a great job, and... I want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, this has been a really informative episode and just quite the quite the audience we have and quite the guest list. So I will start off thanking Diabolic Domino um, for giving us this opportunity. Um, it's just been up and down, but mostly up. So, And Infernal Max, 
it's really been cool starting to work with you and I love watching your videos on the Graves Design channel. Infernal Mystique. Infernal Mystique. Wow, I'm going to get killed for that one. Diabolic Mystique, thank <laughs> you so much for all your amazing, like, your building skills are phenomenal. And Terror Town is going to be an amazing Halloween as always. Um, Diabolic Liz, thank you for all your insight today. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions going forward. Diabolic Par, thank you for just being here. We'll just say that. <laughs> and our source and appearing Oberon is just always a pleasure to have you both here. You really bring out everything in the community. So thank you so much on behalf of Behind the Fang. And any final words or thoughts from anybody? A great thank you to the entire community for participating in this wonderful system that has been developed over these, what, 13 years or so. Uh, it is my pleasure to serve at the pleasure of the source. Thank you all. Have a great day. And, and we thank the source for creating it. And it's my honor to do this for all of you guys. I appreciate the fact that this many people have appreciated the thing which I started. I don't want to say I created it because Progeny has become an evolving entity all by itself. But many people have, have put so much effort into making the Progeny community and system what it is. I am but a single guiding voice and I love you all. Awesome. Thanks everybody for joining us.